The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com slash support. You're listening to The Corbett Report. corbettreport.com People, welcome, welcome to this uh, fourth lecture in the series on uh, resources. Uh, today we have a speaker from Japan, James Corbett. Um, James Corbett is well known among storm circles, so I am actually a little bit interested in who of you already knew James Corbett and his work before before this. Okay, this is about, wow, that's about more than half, I would say. Okay, so the other half uh, basically comes for the topic, um, instead of for James Corbett. So for those people, I, I, I think it's useful that I explain a little bit about what type of journalist uh, James Corbett is. Um, what he does, he calls himself an open source journalist, so basically he looks at all the available information, and then he synthesizes it. But you could also uh, call that open source intelligence. He is basically a one-man intelligence agency uh, who integrates information from pretty much any source and then comes up with a narrative uh, that is usually a, narr- uh, usually a story that is very easily to understand. Well, not, e- not so easy to understand, but it helps you to understand how the world might be working. So for me, and for I think many other people, uh, listening to his media, especially his podcasts, is extremely empowering. You learn things that you would not normally learn from the regular mainstream media. And that is, that is kind of special, and for that reason we have invited him uh, uh, tonight here. So. I think I shouldn't talk too much and let uh, James do the talking. James, please. (laughs) Okay. So, thank you very much, thank you very much. First of all, thank you, Chird, for the lovely introduction, and thank you for setting the ball in motion for me to come here to Groningen. I appreciate that. And let me also thank Studium Generale and their Dutch hospitality that I've been shown so far on this trip. I very much appreciate it. And of course, lastly but not leastly, thank you to all of you for showing up tonight. I really do appreciate you coming here for this lecture. And as you can see, of course, this is a lecture entitled The Secret War, Gladio, and the Battle for Eurasia. So why don't we start by talking about what we're going to talk about. Namely, Central Asia is one of the regions that we'll be talking about tonight. And Central Asia is a vast expanse of the map whose defining characteristic is its ability to defy defy characterization. Uh, Stretching from the shores of the Caspian Sea on the west side to the border of China in the east, and from Iran and Pakistan's doorstep in the south to Russia's in the north. It encompasses everything from the snow-capped slopes of Victory Peak in Kyrgyzstan to the remarkable door to hell in Turkmenistan's Karakum Desert, which, if it is not on your list of things to see before you die, you should put it on that list, uh, to the sprawling grasslands of the Kazakh steppe, and settled by migrants from The Persian, Turkic, Chinese, and Slavic civilizations, its inhabitants speak Kyrgyz, Kazakh, Russian, Tajik, Uzbek, Turkmen, and include Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, and assorted others. The much smaller Caucasus region is a narrow land bridge sandwiched between the Black and Caspian Seas, and is equally diverse. In fact, the region contains over 50 ethnic groups and is home to three local language families, which is something that uh, ling- linguists are still puzzle over, and there's, I mean, it's very, very fascinating in and of itself. And there are several dozen languages spoken in the region, from the obscure Botan Neo-Aramaic, 
tongue, which is, has less than 500 native speakers, to the more widely spoken Azerbaijan and Armenian languages. But despite the rich culture of this history uh, and the history of the region, it is still completely off the radar screens of most of the general public. Tajikistan, Abkhazia, and Astrakhan Oblast are hardly names to conjure by in the popular imagination, after all. But the fact that those names do not resonate with us is perhaps something that is part of a grander strategy that we're going to talk about tonight. And those names that do resonate with us tend to be the names that we have been seen, that have, we have seen in various media stories in the West. For example, Dagestan equates to the Boston bombing in the minds of most Americans, and Chechnya might be familiar to Europeans as that place that Russia is at war with. But just because these stands and oblasts and autonomous republics and, and autonomous regions in this area do not resonate with the general public for the most part, does not mean that they are not important squares on the global chessboard. And just because they may not be on the radar of the general public does not mean they are not on the radar of some of the most powerful players in global geopolitics. And as evidence of that, I present to you the United States-Azerbaijan Chamber of Commerce, which sounds about as important to global geopolitics as the Groningen Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> but when you actually look at some of the current and former advisors, directors, and board members of this organization, you encounter some of the richest and most powerful players in global geopolitics. For example, former Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney, James Baker III, a Bush family advisor, and his son, James Baker IV, for those of you keeping track at home, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, of course, Brent Scowcroft, Richard Armitage of the U.S. State Department, and perennial Washington insider and former national security advisors, Big New Brzezinski, along with many, many others that are, I think, worth checking into. So the question becomes, what is it that these people, some of the most influential people in the field of global geopolitics over the past 50 years, know about this region that the general public doesn't? And I think there are at least two answers to that question. The first answer is the old real estate adage, location, location, location. The region's key location in the backyard of some of the key players and powers of the Eurasian landmass, Russia and China foremost amongst them, has made it a geostrategic prize stretching back thousands of years. Dominated at different times and in varying degrees by Persian empires, Chinese dynasties, Mongol invaders, and Soviet forces, the region has a rich history of being acted upon and a relatively short history as a geopolitical actor in its own right. Its position has long made it a key transport route from the Han Dynasty's uh, Silk Road connecting China to Persia thousands of years ago to the current uh, attempt by Xi Jinping to make a new Silk Road of the 21st century that includes connecting China to Turkey and beyond straight through the heart of this region. But more important even than its location and strategic value are the region's vast, largely untapped resources. The oil and gas fields of the Caspian Sea region are particularly sought after, containing the third largest reserves of any fields on the planet. Azerbaijan in the Caucasus and Kazakhstan in Central Asia have, both have direct access to Caspian Sea oil, with Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan providing ample gas reserves. The dream of a Trans-Caspian pipeline has been in the works for years now to transport Central Asian reserves across the Southern Ca uh, Caucasus and the so-called BTC pipeline funneling the energy through Azerbaijan and Ger Georgia to Turkey and then off to Europe. And that has been equally prized uh, as a way for Europe to find an alternative to Russia's increasingly threatening stranglehold over energy known as Gazprom. The region also contains strategically important deposits of uranium, as well as industrially useful minerals such as copper, manganese, tungsten, zinc, etc. And also gold. Don't discount gold. Another equally important, although seldom acknowledged, resource in this region revolves around the extensive opium trade, especially in Afghanistan. The Afghan opium trade is estimated to bring in as much as $200 billion annually, accounting for as much as 92% of the world's supply. 
As we shall see, control of this region involves domination of the especially lucrative business and all of the attendant economic benefits that result from this connection. The importance of a long-term U.S. presence in the region to establish Western dominance over this location and its resources is no secret. In fact, it has been written about extensively and repeatedly, time and again, by the think tanks that typically serve as the mouthpiece for NATO's foreign policy interests. Case exhibit number one. Take, for example, a 1992 analysis uh, of the region from RAND's National Defense Research Institute entitled Central Asia, the New Geopolitics, which was written shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union while the newly independent republics of the region were still orienting themselves to their new geopolitical reality. And it was penned by Graeme Fuller, a former CIA station chief in Kabul, whose name will come up again later in our study. So keep that face and that name in mind. Uh, He wrote, it is primarily Central Asia's uh, strategic geopolitical location, truly at the continent center, and the broadly undesirable course of events that could emerge if the region were to drift toward instability that constitute the primary American interest in the region. Thus, given the potential for untoward developments in the region for Western interests, modest, hands-on American influence in the region is desirable. Hmm. Uh, This modest, hands-on American influence gained momentum, and by 2004, we had an article published in the Cambridge Review of International Affairs called The United States and Central Asia in the Steps to Stay? Question mark. Zvante E. Cornell of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, raising some of the key reasons for increasing U.S. involvement in the region. As U.S. engagement in Central Asia becomes more permanent, it will increasingly become a factor in both regional politics and the domestic politics of the several Central Asian countries. That role raises a host of questions. Chief among them is how regional powers, such as Russia and China, will react to the U.S. presence. A second concerns the implication both for the political development among the region's states and for the future of radical Islam. Also in 2011, the Project 2049 Institute, which includes Zbigniew Brzezinski's son on its board of directors, published a document proclaiming an agenda for the future of U.S.-Central Asia relations, which contains this interesting passage. U.S. policymakers have been careful to avoid the metaphor of a great game in Central Asia. Yet, it has been often invoked by others, not least by observers in Moscow, Beijing, and other neighboring powers. The U.S. must continue to reject this metaphor, for such notions are based on flawed assumptions and fraught with risks for the United States. Interesting. So what is this great game that the think tanks like the Project 2049 Institute are so eager to avoid comparisons to. The great game refers to the struggle for supremacy between the British and the Russians in the Central Asia region, primarily in the 19th century. The game broadly took place from the signing of the Russo-Persian Treaty of 1813 until the Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907, but although the term was coined in the early 19th century, it didn't hit the popular imagination until Rudyard Kipling's Kim was published in 1901. It was three years after that, in 1904, that the Geographical Journal published an article that articulated the reasons these great powers were engaged in the struggle for this piece of the globe. The article was called The Geographical Pivot of History, and it was written by Sir Halford John, Mac- Sir Halford John Mackinder, P.C., Don't forget the PC, Privy Council, very important. The director of the London School of Economics that was founded by the Fabian Society and folded into the heart of the British establishment in the University of London in 1900. And just as an example of that, the cornerstone of the old building on Hodden Street was laid by King George V himself, interestingly. Mackinder is considered the father of the study of geopolitics. And the geographical pivot of history is the document that is often said to be the founding document of geopolitics and constitutes the first formulation of what would come to be uh, Mackinder's heartland theory. This theory states that the division of what Mackinder called the world island into inherently divided, isolated areas was the principle by which we could understand the evolution.